Good to see you all. Thanks for getting to your seats while I get situated. Uh, this morning we're going to be continuing our series on discerning mental illness. And uh, I texted Smed early this morning and he was kind enough to give me a green light on um, extending this just one more week. So you'll have to endure me once more on this subject. Uh, let me pray and then we'll dive in. God, you are, are so kind to have spoken to us and to give us clear, discerning revelation in your word uh, that we might understand who we are, who you are, what you require of us, um, and experience the blessed benefits of the protection of your word. God, I pray this morning that you would uh, give grace, that there would be uh, grace for me as I preach and uh, try and help us to discern this complex, often misunderstood issue in our day of mental illness, and also grace for those who hear, that you would grant uh, ears to those who are, are gathered here, that it would be insightful and helpful that it would motivate us to uh, just be more confident to further root ourselves in your word, in your truth, so that we might be stable and not blown about by every wind of doctrine. Uh, make, this more, make this equip us to be more capable to step into each other's lives, that uh, we might be a, a conduit of, of blessing and grace to others around us, especially in this church, and God, where this may um, be new or uh, perhaps for even some who are hearing this now or might hear it after the teaching uh, is, is publicly available. God, just grant a soft heart to hear truth and to embrace it and all with the desire to see you glorified, uh, regardless of, what, of the cost. God, we do long to see your name lifted high here in Tempe and wherever we might go with your truth. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. We live in a world that is so confused currently about what is real sickness. Uh, we're so confused about what is real sickness that even lying about being sick has itself become evidence of being sick. Have you ever heard of Munchausen syndrome? I wasn't familiar with Munchausen syndrome until about a week ago. Listen to one article's description of this supposed mental illness. Munchausen syndrome, also known as factitious disorder imposed on self, is a mental health disorder where you falsify, exaggerate, or induce physical, emotional, or cognitive disorders. People with factitious disorders act this way because of an inner need to be seen as ill or injured, not to achieve a concrete benefit such as getting medications or financial gain. So the, the technical term for falsifying illness is malingering. It's called malingering to falsify illness. And that's a term that has pretty much fallen into disuse because of the overabundance of now what qualifies as sickness. It's even hard to falsify illness. Now, how is Munchausen syndrome different from malingering? Well, this article goes on to say that this is distinguishable from malingering, which is where someone exaggerates or fakes an illness to, for example, get out of work. So to fake illness for some obscure, uh, perhaps what can't be discerned as a concrete benefit, that's Munchausen syndrome. But when you do it for a concrete benefit, like getting out of work, that's malingering. 
One is a mental illness. The other is just deception. And this is a sad, sad interpretation of a common human behavior. Thomas Saz, again, author of Psychiatry, the Science of Lies, he says, we in the West have undergone an astonishing cultural perceptual change of which we seem largely, perhaps wholly, unaware. The medical profession defies imaginary illnesses as real illnesses, in effect abolishing the notion of pretended illness. Malingering has become a disease just as real as melanoma. Now, as I mentioned last week from Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, God's word provides sufficient protection for the one who is willing to simply, by faith, take God at his word. Just open up one more time to Proverbs 30. It would be good for us to get our eyes again on this passage. Because this passage promises protection to the one who treats God's word a certain way. Look at Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God proves true. Every word of God proves true. Every single one of them. If God spoke it, it proves true. In the end, it will demonstrate, it will prove itself to be, after all of the scrutiny possible, it will come out pure, perfect. That's what it means for it to be tested or to prove true. Every one of God's words does this. It will prove true. And it says in the second line, he, that is God, is a shield to those who take refuge in him. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So God provides protection for those who retreat to him for safety. Now in this proverbial saying, just capturing this, this single idea of the character of God's word, every single one of God's words is flawless. And to those who retreat to him, he provides this protection. He proves to be a shield. Just notice what those who retreat to him for refuge, by implication in verse 6, are doing. Do not add to his words. The focus is still his words. Every one of those words that proves true, that is in itself flawless, should not, verse 6, be added to or amended in any way, or else he will rebuke you and you be found a liar. Test God's words, put them under some scrutiny, uh, choose to add to them or amend them, take away from them. You have numerous injunctions throughout Scripture to not do this. Don't add, don't take away from them. They're already fine, all on their own. They're perfect. The moment God spoke them, they were perfect as handed to us. So don't mess with them. This is how God proves to be a shield to those who take refuge in him. The one who just takes God at his word, believes him, uh, a sign of humility, receive wisdom, receive God's word. Don't pretend to sit in the driver's seat and be able to do whatever you want with God's word. No, you're in the position we always are by virtue of being creatures and redeemed. We're always in the position of a humble learner, a student before God's word. Psalm 119, 68. You are good and do good. What's the implication? Teach me your statutes. Right? This is the position that we're in. And this verse so helpfully provides protection, just implies, states, up front that God proves to be a protection when you retreat to him for refuge. How do you do that? You just take him at his word. Just think about someone who's been diagnosed with Munchausen syndrome, how they lack the protection that would come 
from living an upright, truthful, honest life and not deceiving others about their illness. What, what, what would Scripture say about Munchausen syndrome? Well, someone who knows their Bible knows what Psalm 58.3 says. The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak falsehood wander in error from birth. You don't have to teach children how to lie. They just come out of the womb fully prepared to deceive, to lie, to speak falsehood. That's a symptom. That's a just endemic to man. And then Proverbs 20 verse 5 adds this, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. What do you what happens when you combine those two realities, right? The scriptures are telling us two things that are true. All men are liars from birth, fully furnished with the ability and even inclination to deceive. And deep down at the heart level, there are purposes, intentions that man has in his heart. It takes wisdom to draw out what is behind the behaviors of man, what's actually happening in the heart, what's the the purpose that's deep as water. It takes wisdom to draw that out and bring it to the surface. Well, when when you just think about these two realities, that means you get people who are willing to deceive for the deep deceptive purposes hidden in the heart. And what have we done with humans who have what may not be readily evident to the observer why they might want to deceive, what's their intention in deceiving. You take someone who is willing to deceive, has purposes deep in the heart, and what have we done? We've put a label on that and said, they're sick. Munchausen syndrome. That excuses what is legitimate sin. Now, Every single psychological diagnosis may not be so easily discerned and may not come down to uh, a simple sin issue where you can just draw a direct beeline from chapter and verse, and that's what the psychological diagnosis is. But many times it is. You can see and just interpret the psychological label in light of what the scriptures say and say, hey, it's not actually labeled that. Scripture calls it something different. Uh, We'll save that for next week and actually look at what Scripture says about some uh, bizarre human behavior as well as not so bizarre human behavior that have gotten psychological labels. That's next week. But this, at least when, when we're thinking about Munchausen syndrome, does give us a clear example of how the psychological worldview actually drives the diagnosis And it does so in direct opposition to what the scriptures say. So I want to just continue this morning and give you a few more reasons why Christians ought to reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness. Christians ought to reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness. I'll just give you a few more reasons and then we'll finish next week with just demonstrating how the Bible actually accounts for every behavioral abnormality mentioned in psychology's Bible, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Uh, Before I uh, I, I continue on with the fourth reason, um, last week we said that the term is a misnomer according to Scripture. Mental illness itself is a misnomer. There is no true mental illness because the mind is immaterial and therefore does not directly suffer from physical sickness. And so to describe the mind, which in in scriptural language, the heart, soul, spirit, as being physically sick is a misnomer. Uh, People are often thinking about the brain, again, which is a physical organ, not mental. So this itself is a, the term itself is a misnomer, but number two, the term lacks any concrete definition. You ask someone who's educated in 
these fields, these social sciences, and they'll, uh, if, if they are well trained and, and understand that they'll know, they'll admit that the term doesn't have any concrete definition actually. And so thirdly, it requires mental, this view of mental illness, the current cultural view of mental illness, requires an evolutionary materialistic anthropology. Your view of man, if you embrace what the world teaches about mental illness, your view of man is founded on, must actually uh, include evolution by natural selection and materialism, uh, materialistic worldview. That just means there is no immaterial self. There's no soul that you can't see. There's no spirit that lives on beyond the body when it dies. All we are is neurons firing. And so you boil all of man's beliefs, emotions, behaviors, thoughts down to his brain activity, what's happening in his brain, which wrongly gets called the mind in this worldview. And that's how you can explain mental illness. As we continue on, I do want to just give this qualification up front. If, if for you, like for me, these things are earth shattering <laughs> as you're hearing them. I remember first looking into these things when I was studying biblical counseling at the master's university. And it seemed like class after class, uh, concept after concept, when you compared the current worldview to what scripture says was just earth shattering for me. Um, it's good to be restrained in, in what we run forward and do with this, right? Don't go tell your, your siblings to get off their medication today. Stop taking those pills or, you know, th those kinds of things just need to be navigated carefully. Um, or even the implications, which again, we'll get to, I want to flesh out a little bit more the shepherding implications for next week. But just want to encourage us to, to be patient, to be sensible in how we hold these things, uh, and just to take some time to prayerfully consider what the implications on your own life might be or those who, with whom you're walking in this church, family members. Uh, what does this truth demand of me if I'm going to step into other people's lives with this truth? And there's just a, a wise, patient way to suffer along with people if that's what's required. So as you're hearing these things, just keep those things in mind um, and, and give prayerful consideration, uh, perhaps slow, thoughtful consideration over some time for what this demands. Nevertheless, number four, moving on, we're looking at several reasons Christians ought to reject this current cultural understanding of mental illness. And fourthly, it's because diagnosing mental disorders lacks the objectivity of true medical diagnoses. Diagnosing mental disorders lacks the objectivity of true medical diagnoses. So what would you expect to happen if you're trying to diagnose something that, as we said in number two, lacks any concrete definition? The definition itself is subjective. So what would you expect to happen when a doctor, someone, you know, white lab coat, degrees that they've earned and they've been deemed by an academic institution wise, right? They've gotten a thumbs up from academic institutions that believe this falsehood. What would you expect to happen when someone takes their ambiguous definition and then tries to prescribe based on that ambiguous subjective definition. Well, what you would get is this, a lack of objectivity in diagnosis. Let me quote, and this is, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, this quote in particular, I'm pulling from uh, a class taught at Yale University. So they've got open courses you can find on uh, iTunes or Apple Music. And this guest lecturer, Susan Nolan Hoeksema, uh, 
says this in Paul Bloom's class. Uh, this was the 18th lecture of the course, What Happens When Things Go Wrong, Mental Illness Part 1. And here is what Susan Nolan Hoeksema admits in her introduction to this guest lecture. She says, a lot of people who come into my course say, well, of course you guys have it all figured out. You know where to draw the line. You have criteria. You have blood tests, right, that tell me whether I have depression or schizophrenia or one of the things I've read about. Well, the reality is that we don't. First of all, there are no biological tests for any of the known mental disorders right now. There's an air of hope in that. And instead, what we have are a set of behavior criteria for how to diagnose different mental disorders. And what I mean by behavioral criteria is a set of symptoms that a person reports to you about how they feel, about how they think, and a set of observations about their behavior and how typical or atypical it is. And you take that sort, you take the sort of set of symptoms that the person shows or reports to you, match them up against the existing criteria for mental disorders, and then it comes down to a fairly subjective judgment call about whether the person meets the criteria or not. Unfortunately, because they are so subjective, they can be influenced by a lot of factors. She's the expert saying this. Teaching students at an Ivy League school how to think about mental illness. Now this is, in, in my mind, a damning confession, <laughs> but in her mind, it's just a caveat to then forge on with the philosophical presuppositions and to, to justify how to diagnose people with mental illnesses. She's admitting, just notice in the quote, that there are no real means of testing outside of reporting and observation to formulate the diagnosis. They report to you, you observe, and voila, you have a diagnosis. Just think about what would happen to you if this is how real medical diagnoses were, were undertaken? Doc, I got this pain in my chest. It's been happening for two weeks. Um, every time I, I get on my treadmill, it's just these sharp pains happening. Um, and then when I stop running, they go away. What do you think? You need open heart surgery, sir. This is, this is the problem. You're reporting to me as I take into account the subjective range of symptoms you've described. I've determined that you're sick with whatever, and the solution, my prescription for you, is open heart surgery. Who would, who would seek a second opinion? Right. But this is what's happening under the guise of science and medicine. It's not medicine. No one would do this in the, the actual medical field, but I mean, people who would practice something like this would be disbarred and sued for, for malpractice. But this actually passes for legitimate science in the realm of psychology and psychiatry. Peter Gray, I mentioned him last week, he wrote a textbook uh, taught in that same course at Yale, Psychology. In his sixth edition, he makes a similar admission. Although these criteria, he says, are useful guidelines for thinking about and identifying mental disorders, they are by nature ambiguous, open to a wide range of interpretations. And he says, these are tough questions that can never be answered strictly scientifically. The answers always represent human judgments, and they are always tinged by the social values and pragmatic concerns of those doing the judging. Interesting. They're always tinged by the social values and pragmatic concerns 
i.e. worldview of those doing the judging. You walk into a therapist's office, the, the, the help you're going to get is completely dependent and tied to the worldview of the therapist. If he doesn't believe what we just read in Proverbs 30, then he's going to counsel based on that erroneous presumption. And so you get an atheist in the counselor's seat and you get an atheist counsel. Now Thomas says, who's on the other side of this issue, also uh, not a believer, but on the other side of the, the issue he sees, what's wrong with this, he says this, except for a few objectively identifiable brain diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, there are neither biological or chemical tests, nor biopsy or necropsy findings for verifying or falsifying DSM diagnoses. So he agrees with the other two psychiatrists, psychologists. There are no objective ways of testing these things. But he takes the other path. <laughs> Therefore, let's not call it illness. And we would agree with him, but on biblical grounds. You might be, be thinking, in, uh, perhaps, well, what about chemical imbalances? Isn't that scientific? Aren't there chemical imbalances in the brain that pr produce various mental illnesses? It's a valid question. First off, it's, it's important to understand that the notion of chemical uh, imbalance has only ever been a theory, and like evolution has only been a theory, this too has been taught as fact. There's never been any, anything verified about the chemical imbalance theory. But I want you to hear how one Christian physician points out the flaw in this theory, in the chemical imbalance theory. Robert Smith, in the Christian Counselor's Medical Desk Reference, now out of print, he says this, There are true chemical imbalances in the body. But when they are present, the condition is no longer labeled chemical imbalance. It is labeled according to the chemical that is out of balance. And it is given a medical disease label. Low thyroid is a chemical imbalance, but it is called hypothyroid or hypothyroidism instead of chemical imbalance. Low potassium is a chemical imbalance, but it is called hypokalemia. High blood pressure is a chemical imbalance, but it is called diabetes. When people talk about chemical imbalance as a cause for depression, it is because there are no laboratory tests to prove this. Remember, an illness means something is wrong in the tissues of the body. If there is truly something wrong with the body, it can be proved by objective tests performed by an objective observer. The reality is that there are no laboratory tests that can prove the presence of a chemical imbalance. The chemical imbalance diagnosis of an illness is not proven by tests, but is based on what a person thinks and feels as described by the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Whenever the term chemical imbalance is used, it is as a generic term without proof that any change is present in any chemical. And even more recently, within the past couple of years, uh, there's been more research done. Uh, even in the secular world, people have been, become more forthright about the chemical imbalance theory being wrong when it comes to something like depression. You know, in, uh, I think it was in the 90s or, yeah, in the 90s, the, the Zoloft drug hit the market and they explained in that first commercial, maybe some of you remember this, the little white blob that's kind of jumping along and he's sad and then they explained the chemical imbalance theory about how transferring from in, within the synapse from one neuron to the next, your dopamine levels can, can be lower and so that produces depression and here we've got this, this magic pill to solve that. That theory is, is uh, just, even by the secular community, been renounced uh, 
more so now. But Christians who are always agreeing with Scripture, uh, who recognize the protection in how Scripture describes things like anxiety, like depression, uh, who didn't cave to the social anxiety diagnoses or labels, but rather said this is fear, right? Scripture has a category. Christians who did that experienced the protection that Scripture affords and just agreeing with God. But if you're thinking about chemical imbalances, that's the way to think about it, is that this is not a scientific either, but merely a way of describing what people have deemed right based on a worldview assumption. Number five in, in our reasons why Christians ought to reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness is that there, are no, there is no psychological standard for normal human behavior. Therefore, abnormality is indeterminable. There is no standards, psychologically speaking, for normal human behavior. And since there's no standard for this is normal, then abnormality can't even be determined, right? Uh, Dale Johnson, in his book, The Church is a Culture of Care, helpfully says this, the DSM offers hundreds of diagnoses to categorize abnormal human behaviors and emotions, all without ever defining normal human experience. For Christians, this ought to be a somewhat alarming revelation, or at least raise a yellow flag of caution. How do we define abnormal states of human experience without first having some sort of understanding of normalcy? It seems as though the DSM begins with a cultural appraisal, appraisal of normalcy, and then on the basis of this ever-shifting understanding, proceeds to describe unwanted emotions and behaviors as abnormal. Does that make sense? There is no, they can't say, here's the standard of normal universally. For human beings in all places, everywhere, at all times, this is normal human experience. Why can't they do that? Because there is no standard. There is no single unifying source of authority that everybody can agree on and say, okay, based on that source of authority, that's normal, we all agree. So when things don't align with that, here's what we're calling abnormal. And then Dale Johnson in, in that book goes on to say, to answer the question, what's normal? What's normal? Jesus. Jesus is normal. He is the ideal man, the ideal human. If you're looking for a standard to aim at, live life like him. That's normal human life. That's the standard. That's the ideal. And if you're not like him, then you're somewhere on the spectrum of abnormal. All of you, all of us. <laughs> Even think about uh, Jesus, obviously the ideal. Uh, beyond him, what, what examples does scripture give us to aim at, to live like? Hebrews 11 would point to all the men of faith, right? Those faithful saints who ran their race, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, those who believed the promises. Notice the, what, what created uh, something to aim at for them? Believing God. I would include the blessed man of the Psalms, the righteous man of the Psalms, and the Sermon on the Mount. That's an ideal existence in a fallen world even a way to live, Solomon's proverbial wise man, the wise man, normal. He lives a blessed life in God's world, under God's authority. He lets the creator tell him how to live in the creator's world, and he agrees with God. He doesn't add to his words. That's normal. You know, the words that go, so, kind of go along with normalcy, healthy, well-functioning. What's not well-functioning? Well, the fool, 
the fool is obviously not well functioning, and that would just be a fun study all its own. Just who's the fool? And just read through Proverbs. Maybe, maybe you just take the month of September, read through Proverbs, and just make a list answering the question, who is the fool? What is he like? What are his characteristics? Lazy, unteachable, obstinate, uh, suicidal. All who hate me, wisdom says, love death. That's the fool. Suicidal. You're, have you thought about suicidal, uh, suicidal tendencies? Not being evidence of mental illness, but being evidence of a rejection of God's wisdom. Folly. So scripture interprets these things for us. It gives us a standard for normalcy based on which the Christian can say, that's not normal, that's not right, that's not healthy living. It, it doesn't reveal a sound mind. There's answers, scripture says. Because this uh, lack of a, an authority, there's no plumb line for unbelievers to define what is normal, this obviously would lead to an ever-changing standard for what qualifies as mental illness, right? If, if 50 years ago, the culture was very different than it is today, two years ago, the culture was very different than it is today, then, then what gets labeled mental illness today was different back then. In the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses, homosexuality was included as a mental illness. And there was something to that. That was abnormal. We would agree in some sense that that is evidence of an unsound mind. Romans 1 truth suppression. Now, it's actually virtuous for a man to dress like a woman and pretend to be a gender that he is not. And then if, if you don't accept that person's so-called reality, you're the one with the mental illness. This is ever-changing standards. Even, again, Thomas says, I like this guy. He makes the point, in 1973, when the American Psychological Association removed homosexuality from its roster of mental illnesses, it first replaced it with ego dystonic homosexuality. When that term, too, became an embarrassment, it, too, was abolished. How do you know? You don't. You have to wait for the updated DSM to know how sick you actually are now. Just think about the solidity, the stability that just believing God's word affords. Here we are, the church, nothing extraordinary before the world, no appealing wisdom to offer them. Just over here, crazy folks saying, no, I believe that old book because Psalm 19 tells me that every one of God's judgments is right, is true, they endure forever, and they say, y'all are crazy. And we say, yep, we are crazy enough to believe God, and you too need to have a change of mind. It's called repentance. And we've just continued believing the same thing over and over and over again. And the world looks at that and labels us fools, but actually envies the stability and fortitude and courageousness that come from believing this age-old book. That's enviable, even in the world. The Christian, thinking rightly, thinking biblically, and we'll get into this more next week, the Christian's not on medication if he's thinking rightly about what God, God's Word says. But we're sick, <laughs> apparently. There's just a, a tremendous freedom that comes from taking the simplicity and authority and clarity of God that he has communicated. 
So we should do that. Uh, finally for today, this is number six. The sixth reason I want to encourage you to just reject the current cultural understanding of mental illness is because psychological labels are inherently instructive. Psychological labels, believe it, are inherently instructive. They tell us something about ourselves and about the world the minute we receive them, the minute we accept them as fact. They're instructive. Uh, a label itself is worldview laden. It's saturated. It just comes hand in hand with a worldview. Think about what you're called, Christian. Christian. Someone else calls themselves a Christian. Well, because you know how to think about Christians, if you know the, what the Bible says about people who follow Christ, you can assume a lot of things about that person's worldview. If someone says, I'm a Christian, then you know if they are in fact a Christian, then they are one who believes that God exists and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. They believe that God is one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Christian believes that Jesus, the only Son of God, lived a perfect life that no one could live, he died a substitutionary death to save sinners from God's wrath before ra being raised three days later. After that, he ascended to the right hand of the Father where he currently waits before he returns to rescue his church and then return in judgment. That label implies all of that. In a similar way, psychological labels come packaged with a worldview. And just two ways to think about this. How do psychological labels teach us? Well, they teach us in a, at least a couple ways. They teach us about identity and they teach us about morality. Psychological labels do this. They teach us something or say something to us rather. They don't actually provide real knowledge. But they do say something to us about our identity and about what is moral. Even unbelieving therapists have recognized this. Therapists like Gary Greenberg, he says in his book, Manufacturing Depression, he says, for a psychiatrist to say that you have the disease of depression is to tell you not only about your health, but also about who you are, what is wrong with your life, and how it should be set right, and who you would be if only you were healthy. In making these pronouncements, the doctor draws on the authority of science, quote-unquote, which presumably has no stake in the outcome. He couches his judgments in the language of sickness and health rather than sin and virtue, which means that he is cloaking his morality even from himself in science. Isn't that interesting? You take one person who is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, a la Psalm or Romans 1, excuse me, Suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. This is what sinners do. They are under the wrath of God. They do not want to submit to God's authority. And so they suppress the truth. They pretend like they don't know what's true is actually true. I.e., God is real. He's the only God that exists. He's made his law known to me at the conscience level and I break his law, I am condemned before him, I am accountable to him, I ought to obey him better than I do. He is worthy of all thanksgiving and praise. This is what Paul explains in Romans 1. What would someone who is in that hardened state of truth suppression do if you gave them the title of doctor? Therapist, psychiatrist, 
what kinds of ways would they seek to explain the world in their truth suppression? And this is what I think Greenberg, even as an unbeliever, rightly observes. He would couch his language in the language of sickness and health rather than sin and virtue. So instead of using moral terms, he uses medical terms. And this is what is happening. It's amazing to me as I, I just read through some of these uh, resources of even people in the secular community who are recognizing this in their truth suppression. Still, not wanting to submit to Christ, but realizing the absurdity of where this is headed. Robert Whitaker, uh, a journalist, author of Anatomy of an Epidemic, recognizes the, the shift, how this shift has impacted children. He says, our children are the first in human history to grow up under the constant shadow of mental illness. So he's going to recognize, he's going to acknowledge that this actually does inform how they think about themselves. Identity. He says, not too long ago, goof-offs, cut-ups, bullies, nerds, shy kids, teachers, pets, and any number of other recognizable types filled the schoolyard. And all were considered more or less normal. Right? That's just, a, that's just life at school. Nobody really knew what to expect from such children as adults. That was part of the glorious uncertainty of life. The goof-off in the fifth grade might show up at his high school's 20-year reunion as a wealthy entrepreneur, the shy girl as an accomplished actress. But today, children diagnosed with mental disorders, most notably ADHD, depression, and bipolar illness, help populate the schoolyard. These children have been told that they have something wrong with their brains and that they may have to take psych psychiatric medications the rest of their lives, just like a diabetic takes insulin. The medical dictum teaches all of the children on the playground a lesson about the nature of humankind, and that lesson differs in a radical way from what children used to be taught. He's right. He's right. That's a right observation. So it is identity shaping the psychological labels. Uh, I am so thankful to uh, have grown up when I did, to have had the parents that I was blessed to have who didn't go that route. You know, some, some of my uh, teachers, you know, he mentions the fifth grade, I, my fifth grade teacher might be a little abhorred to know what I'm doing with my life right now. <laughs> so these things aren't determinative. Uh, you know, just being at a young age like that, the, the behaviors demonstrated at that time, praise God, are not determinative. And conversion, just a single life event, changes everything, doesn't it? It changes everything. Even for me, this holds true. I hated learning. I was unteachable. I was a lazy, terrible student. And when God saved me, I, I wouldn't have explained it like this at the time, but looking back, one thing that changed about me is I began to love learning. What happened? Well, Proverbs 1-7 happened to me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I despised wisdom and instruction. I hated learning. I did not want to be a student because that required the humility to admit I didn't know everything. And when God humbled me by the gospel, I admitted finally for once <laughs> I didn't know everything. I knew, I knew so little I couldn't even save myself. The most important knowledge that I needed was inaccessible and unwanted by me. And when God humbled me under the gospel, I thought, I need to be humble. I should learn some stuff. Some, some people who know better. 
got here, met Josh Kelso, and asked him, what in the world is heart shepherding? You keep using that term. You clearly know more than me and are way more humble. You have to tell me about what, that thing you're doing, heart shepherding. This is what conversion does. This is what the gospel does. Take somebody who could be diagnosed with a mental illness and makes them a, a functioning, productive human being. The other thing besides identity that we, we can be, we are taught when we embrace psychological labels is that they teach us about morality. And I would just add to this, in doing so, in teaching us about what is moral and what is not, the psychological label has excused great as well as lesser forms of evil. Psychological labels, this, this worldview that comes with the psychological label, has ended up excusing very great forms of evil. How many people have gotten off from heinous acts of evil worthy of death under the insanity plea? Just one example of this, Andrea Yates drowned her five children all under the age of seven in a bathtub. She was intelligent enough to wait till her husband left intelligent enough to lock the dog up so that the dog didn't interfere and try to protect the children. But instead of some worthy sentence, she lives her life in a mental institution because she is sick. She's mentally ill. She was deemed after committing the, the act, not before, that's interesting, she was deemed after the fact to have been diagnosed with various mental disorders when she committed the murder of her five children. There is no objectivity, objective science that you can seek to leverage to make that claim. It's, it's sad to, just even in researching this, looking up some of the, the case, cases of uh, people who have gotten a lesser sentence or been uh, adjudicated based on a plea of insanity is insane uh, and, and just heartbreaking. It is the world we live in. So justice doesn't go forth because people are mentally ill, they say. You know, maybe, maybe we, we can look at great forms of evil like that and say, well, it's obvious. Clearly that's error. But what about lesser forms of, of evil? Open up to Matthew 6. You know, what we might call a lesser form of evil, this isn't someone killing their children, but it's still no small matter to Jesus. What about the sin of anxiety? That's gotten a pass in our day, has it not? Because people are sick. I want you to see what Jesus says, Matthew 6, verse 25. Actually, start at verse 24. Jesus potently says, No one can serve two masters. No one can do this. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Because you can't serve God and wealth, don't worry about these things. Do not be anxious about these things. 
that money can buy, food, drink, clothing, i.e., you can't be worried about those things. You can't be anxious about this life and still, in that same moment, regard God as your master. Do you understand? Anxiety is a faith issue. It's not a brain malfunction. It's a faith malfunction. You cannot serve God and man. Excuse me, God and wealth. You can't serve God and man either. But since you can't serve God and wealth, don't be worried. Verse 26, notice his solution. Not a pill, not a label, ornithology. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Not their heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father. God's fatherly care ought to solve anxiety for us. And when we're thinking right, when we're at our best, walking in faith, believing God, it does do that. We're not anxious. Who of you, by being worried, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the, the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? What's the problem? Faith. Faith. Your little, your smallness of faith is why you're anxious. Do not worry then. What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? Why? Verse 32, for all these things, the Gentiles, the unbelieving people, they eagerly seek that. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But what should we do? Instead of being worried, we should seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Press into the kingdom. Possess a righteousness that citizens of the kingdom have. Make that your concern. Notice how faith and righteousness, faith and obtaining the kingdom are tied. Believers inherit the kingdom and their lives look this way. They don't worry. They're not dominated, mastered by anxiety, regardless of what the world says they might have. We need this kind of faith. We need courage to, to believe God. Grace Bible contramundum. <laughs> when the rest of the world says God's word is false, Grace Bible needs to be saying against the world, no, God is true, and let every man be a liar. And there are some ways that we need to carefully, patiently walk with each other as we think about how to apply this truth even as we think about the, the biblical categories for what passes for mental illness. And we'll get to that next week in the, in the final lesson in the series. Let's pray. God, thank you again for your incredible word. We have light. <laughs> thank you. We have light. Where we would be darkened in our understanding otherwise, we have the light of your word which is life to us. You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go, Jesus? And so I pray that you would help us, strengthen us to draw near to you, to seek refuge in you so that you might be glorified, Lord, and so that we might experience the blessed protection that you afford us as those who receive your word humbly. And we ask all these things. It is in your name alone. Amen.